Now we'll look at the biology of language, starting with the classic distinction between Broca's area and Wernicke's area. And this is typically the level at which things are covered in an in intro psychology class. This idea that Broca's area here in the frontal lobes is important for uh, syntax and speech production. Wernicke's area, in, in contrast, is where you have semantics and understanding of the meaning of words. Uh, and so, you know, this kind of syntax, semantics, dissociation, very simplistically represented in different areas of the brain. And to first order of approximation, that's, you know, probably a reasonable distinction. Uh, we know that the frontal cortex is very important for sequencing, structuring, producing speech, um, and those are all very important aspects of syntax. Whereas posterior cortex here in Wernicke's area is important for these distributed overlapping representations of things like word meaning. Wernicke's is really just right on that hub between your auditory representations of words and the visual channel of seeing words. And so when you're naming uh, objects, that's going to be where, where that's going to happen is in Wernicke's area. So these things make sense in general. Uh, they were discovered as a result of uh, damage in different parts of the brain. And when you see patients who've had uh, these kind of strokes or other sources of damage in these different brain areas, um, you get these very striking dissociations. And so here's a classic example of somebody with Wernicke's aphasia, uh, damage to that particular posterior cortical area, or at least generally in that area. And somebody asks this person, how are you today? And then they start talking and they go, whoa, okay, <laughs> all this weird stuff. What are you saying? Uh, it's kind of word salad. It's, it's just a bunch of uh, kind of random uh, stream of consciousness associations, but it's, it's very fluent. Uh, there's, you know, some syntactic structure to what's being said. Um, and so uh, that is sort of like this idea that you have a disconnection between the real semantic meaning of what you're trying to say and the uh, kind of ability to syntactically structure what you're saying. Um, and here's another example, uh, just all this kind of free association uh, of, uh, you know, a whole long sequence of speech. You can look at this in the slides if you're interested. Whereas Broca's area seems to be particularly important for controlling the speech apparatus and uh, that's uh, kind of then extends to uh, the higher levels of syntax to some extent at least. Um, and people with Broca's aphasia have difficulty even saying any kind of words at all. So it's very non-fluent speech and just say like me hungry, kind of caveman style speech, uh, so to speak. So you do see dissociations. The exact, you know, it's not like we have modules for syntax and, and semantics like that. There's lots of interactions between the pathways, uh, very big fiber bundles, the arcuate fasciculus that connects them. And so it's not really just a simple kind of uh, dissociation story like you'd uh, see in the, in the psych textbooks. But um, to first order of approximation, there are differences along these lines between these different areas. But as we said earlier, there's many more uh, aspects of uh, cognitive function that are involved in language beyond those two kind of canonical areas. Although it does tend to be the case, if you look kind of in areas around this central hub, those do have a higher chance of kind of being language related uh, in general. Um, and the homunculus along the motor strip here uh, is such that your kind of mouth, tongue areas are all in this lower area of the um, frontal and somatosensory cortex that kind of lined up across the border here. Um, and so that also anchors language in this kind of core central region. So now we're going to talk about uh, the details of phonology. And partly this is just fascinating. Um, it's a little bit gross. I find it a little bit gross, but um, I'm easily grossed out, uh, especially if you see a video. I think we have a link in the textbook for the uh, um, vocal cords, that's like, you know, alien crazy level stuff. Um, so, uh, but anyway, and I especially don't want to think about my tongue uh, moving around. If you see, again, videos of how much your tongue moves, really all of it's pretty bad. But anyway, it's amazing 
what uh, kind of incredible choreography of uh, motor action has to go on to produce pronounce, you know, comprehensible speech. And it takes us a long time. Uh, if you have kids, you, you hear this gradual progression of like baby talk to, you know, actual, you know, interpretable speech. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, and that learning process is really fascinating. And actually someone in my lab is, is developing models based on predictive learning to understand how that process works. And so it's really a good example of, of how complex motor action can be learned through some kind of forward model generative learning process. Anyway, here's the details about how it works. A primary distinction in speech output is between vowels and consonants. Vowels are things you can sing. Uh, they involve a open pathway of sound through the whole articulatory system. And they vary in the kind of position of the tongue relative to the front versus back and how kind of open or closed the tongue is. Um, you have kind of rounded versus unrounded, um, how, how open or closed the mouth is. I don't really know all the details, but um, this is a, a standard chart of all the different phonological vowels that we have. Down here, we have a version that was due to Dave Plout and colleagues that uses standard kind of ASCII characters instead of the International Phonological Alphabet uh, to represent these things. And so you have things like E and A up here, which are uh, kind of close uh, and to the front. And then you have U and O, which are in the back. Your tongue is more moved back. Um, and you have down here, you have the open A uh, versus close E. So that has to do with the position of your mouth. And all of these things just change the overall kind of sound or resonance that comes out. And so these things are pretty easy to generate using a simple kind of tube model with different kind of openings and closings at different points that create these different essential frequency differences in these sounds. But the consonants are much more interesting and varied because they involve different ways of blocking the sound by putting your tongue up against your teeth or your lips. So like the plosive sound like puh is this blockage of air from your lips closing and then exploding out the sound comes um, making that P sound spitting all over the place. Um, and so that is one category of words. Uh, tuh, duh are dentals because it involves your teeth, uh, connect, connecting your tongue to your teeth. Um, and so this is a chart of the overall uh, space of uh, different phonemes in terms of where these constraints are. And so the consonant involves always some kind of constraint or constriction on the airflow in comparison to the vowel. And the vocal cords in particular kind of are a little like reed-like thing that create this frictiony type sound for voiced uh, phonemes and and, um, and so like duh it, that duh, that droning sound is kind of the the operation of the vocal cords versus t t t t t is a unvoiced version that's very similar to duh. And so what we do in our models is we kind of basically model this table in our more detailed models, uh, having different neurons or feature representations that encode each of these different ways in which the sound can be blocked and how it flows through the system. And with that, we can have a pretty reasonable kind of similarity structure of different sounds with each other.